tell us what we just finished and what's what we're going to do today. Well, I just finished painting the inside of the car, doing the bottom. Today we're going to put the suspension back under and get it back on the ground where it's on all four wheels. You don't want to paint a car in a rotisserie, right? You can rotate the rotisserie, you can turn it. I like it on the ground, especially trying to fit the body panels. Now this suspension is all new, right? Yeah, it's all new or restored. Suspension parts, minus the uh, drivetrain parts as far as the engine and transmission. And then uh, it'll be set and level with tires, and that way you can fit the, the body gaps and everything. And paint the car. Uh, most of the parts are ready to go. I got everything laid out. Um, this group right here is all the front. This group here. Hard to believe, but this 1967 Shelby was one of 172 built with the paint code T for Candy Apple Red of 2048. 1967 GT500. So, what parts would you install first? Jason begins with the brake and the fuel line. Rear end and the springs, they're kind of in the way, so we'll go ahead and put the fuel in the brake line and then start on the leaf springs in the rear end. And to get the ball rolling. What's that? This is the bolt for the uh, proportioning valve for the brakes, which goes in the engine compartment. Okay. So technically, the first part applied to this bare unit body is proportion valve, and then the uh, rear brake line, and then the fuel line. Uh, right here on the inside. Oh. Oh, okay. Right. Let me get all the bolts, clips ready for the fuel line. Off These are regular steel ones, like we had on original. But the drawback of stainless, if you got to tweak one, like you're trying to fit it, and it's not quite the right bin, you got to tweak it around. Well, then the stainless don't want to bend as easy. Runs down the rocker panel, then it comes across the torque box right here. This is a little bit of a later style, and it has a protector. It protects the fuel line so you don't jack on it and crush it or it don't hit something. So this was original, came with the car, and I had to clean it up because they actually had a traction bar bracket welded to it right here. So I had to clean all that weld and stuff off and restore it. it it's painted in a paint that looks like bare metal. And it runs along the rocker panel and you've got to tweak it around because they bend it for shipping. I'll tweak them and get them to tuck up under. Got a clip, clip like that that holds it with a bolt through it. And then these actually go through the torque box and they have a rubber line that puts them together. And this finishes it off. It goes through the torque box. And there's a little grommet. It goes through the blanche panel. That's what's nice about those buying the kits, is you get all the little parts you need like that. That little grommet goes in there, and you got to put a little bit of lube on that. Grease. And it'll pop right in. See, this thing's actually bent uh -huh. a little bit, so it has to be tweaked up and around to fit. Of course, it has a clip here. You've got to tweak it until it fits. This is not plug and play, not a video game. What's this other hole for up here? 
That's just a lineup hole from the factory where they built the assembly. Just put plugs in those. Hey, Shelby. Hey. Now you're going to clip this one, huh? Yeah. There's a small clip. That's a little snap clip. Oh, uh-oh. Oh. oh. That sticker's preventing that thing from sliding in there, huh? Got it? Got that snapped in there. So the fuel line's installed now. It's done? It's done. Now we'll do the brake line. It's got its own clips. They fold over and they have a seal. Then you pinch them with pliers in a pre-stamped hole. You usually screw the end into the junction block first. Line wrench will work best. They have a slot cut out of them. Okay. I can see that it has a bend around that cross member. So you can tweak that around there. Bend it. And here's the first clip going on. Folds. And that got a hole there. And this has a little seal and everything, and it goes in that hole. Up together like that, and that's holds it in. When you put new lines in, you absolutely have to have new clips. You can't reuse the old ones. Go back and straighten any kind of little bends out of this long. Gotta pull it. What about the gas tank? No, we don't have a gas tank right now. Would we, if we had one, would we put it on? Ah, uh, you can. It doesn't. And this has a. Got to come over to here, but the uh, there's actually a proportioning valve that goes in there. That's the rear brake line. Now we're gonna install the leaf springs. Disassembled and restored. Thing I'm probably gonna install first is the uh, spring bumpers. Yeah. Anti wrap ups. And these mount right here. And those are the holes that Shelby drilled. Shelby American. These are the actual original bolts that held them. Straight from Shelby, 1967. They have an RBW markings on the bolt and then they just use a regular nut no washer no nothing nut goes on the bottom side and just like that it kind of has a boss right there that looks like it had a washer i think it's amazing that rubber snubber survived all these years all we did was clean it up it's original barn didn't hurt that part now what Got the new spring shackles. Yeah, these are the rear spring shackles. Uh, normally they're always like this with both studs. This one has one on opposite because it makes it a little easier to access when the nuts because of the exhaust hanger is a little tight. You gotta order that special, otherwise you'll just get two like that. It's kind of a concourse little trick deal. To have the two piece one like that. The two piece goes on the right side. Goes like that. The exhaust runs right through there. Now we got the front eye bolts.
body in the spring. Let's list them in. got a bolt that goes through it, that 9 16 nut on each other, lock nut. You just tighten, snug those up until they stop. They have a shoulder, so you just uh, tighten them until it locks up. How do you know how far to tighten it? It stops. There's actually these have a shoulder. Normally a ratchet wouldn't fit. These are rubber bushings like factory, so you don't have to grease them. Alright, now we'll put the rear end in. You assemble this thing. Then you're gonna have to have a transmission jack or something like that. I always assemble it in a car because it's easier for being a one person. So I can just grab it. It's got these lineup pins on the side. Pop right down. And that's positioned. You got these brand new U bolts. Makes it nice when you pull them out of the package and they're all the correct finish. Now this assembly you're doing, is this something that a lot of people that are amateurs could do? Oh yeah, anybody could for the most part could do this. Probably the only thing that gets complicated on the suspension is when you put the front springs in, you gotta compress them. This is the shock bracket. You know, some of the later cars, they had staggered shocks. It has a different bracket here, and you'll have one shock here and one shock in the front. Okay. Now those brackets painted? They're originally bare metal, so they're painted with a paint that looks like bare metal. These are torqued, so I zip them up with the impact. Okay, now we gotta torque those. Torque them in between 35 and 40 foot pounds. Kind of alternate so that they're even. Torque.
nuts in. Jason reproduced the X on the axle housing and the 964, which is seen on the axle tag. 964. Yeah, just make sure it's good and clean. And I got the gasket installed. I'll set the uh, third member in there. Kind of fun because it's 75 pounds. So you work out with weights first? <laughs> Need to. Need a good warm up. Okay, now it has a copper washer, which acts as a seal and a nut. That's what holds it in and they're torqued to uh, 35 pounds. Yeah, I'll put the original tag. Luckily we still have that. It's got a little surface rust, but it's really pretty clean. It goes right there. And they were ranged from all through there because they just stuck it on there and then tightened the nut up and it would move as it tightened. And this one, the hole is a little boogered. So it needs to be filed out because it won't go over the stud. Close. It was on there at one time, but I don't know how they got it off. Well, it looks good. So that just tightens down with the nut to 35 foot pounds? Yep. So our rear end is installed, huh? Pretty much. There's no oil in it though? No, no. You still got to install the axles and the outer gaskets before you put any kind of oil in them. Felpro gasket, but you can actually trim it. You can mark it and take a X-Acto knife and cut right next to the housing. Now I'm going to install the uh, axle seals. It's a seal and bearing race driver. You gotta tap it until it seats so it runs in the right place. Next, I'm going to put the axles in and the, back, the brake backing plates, the bolts for those. They're a special type of bolt. They go to here. Yeah, the brake backing plate. There is a left and right. The hole goes towards the front of the car. That's for the emergency brake. It takes one of these gaskets and it actually takes two of these gaskets. If the seal does seep a little bit, it, it will seep and go out this little area right here. This gasket, it'll make it come out the back side of the axle instead of on the inside where the brakes are. So it's kind of like a little drainage system if it does ever seep. Then there's another gasket on this side, and then the axle goes in, and that'll keep the oil and grease from getting on your brakes and causing a safety issue. A little grease on the seal. What kind of grease is that? And it could be any grease. This is just a bearing grease. Keeps it from being dry, and it kind of damage on the seal. Then there's another gasket. It goes on this side. There's an access hole through the axle, and that's where you tighten the nut up through. Is this just to secure the backing plate? This secures the backing plate and the axle into the uh, carrier. That's what's nice about these 9 inch. You can remove the axle anytime without having to drain the oil, change a bearing, or it makes it a lot more service friendly. Of course, this other side is going to be the same assembly procedure. So 
So let's move on to. We'll go ahead and get the weight on the front because we got so much weight on the back right now. Uh, we we'll start with the control arms and the spindles. Install the springs. Waist level for me. What we got? These are the spindles. First part setting out here, and then we'll do the set the control arms and next. Set them out. Yeah, you know, the parts together. Getting the parts together, a huge deal in the Jason White system of restoration. Restoration is organization. Upper and lower control arm, spindle, um, spring perch, spring perch, and the attaching hardware. The coil springs. Mount this to the upper control arm. This is what the uh, spring actually sits on, on top of the control arm. This is a bit of an upgrade spring perch. It has a polyurethane bushing in here. They're a little more expensive. But they have a bearing in there. Normally you cannot turn this on a stock one. This turns super easy. So that allows the pivot of the spring to move smoother. So you have less suspension noise and it will handle smoother and better than the stock perch. Plus with the polyurethane bushing in there, it'll last forever. Looks identical. You can't Unless you really looked at the side of it. These are reproduction control arms from a company called Rare Parts. And they're exactly as original. Do you think we should rebuild the originals? Let's go back and answer those critics right now. Okay. This is not Jason's first rodeo. You can rebuild these, but it is a pain. Don't feel bad, but it feels, feels like it's got rust in it. You see where the grease is coming out right here where they greased with the zerk. This nut here threads into the control arm. When you get that out, most of the time it eats the threads up. 50-50 if, if it comes out and doesn't destroy the control arm. Most times these are just to buy a control arm. Brand new, don't have a pity, no rust. There's another company that makes the correct four rivet. And they're exactly as originals. And that's what we got right here. Uh, they come in black. I stripped the paint off and clear coated them because the originals were uh, bare metal. They have the uh, correct riveted in ball joint instead of the bolted ones. And then a lot of the new ones just have three rivets. These are absolutely correct. So these look just like the originals? Yeah, exactly like the originals. Get these bolted to that and then we'll put them on the car. Right up on the upper control arms. Let's go in there. They got a lock washer and a just a regular nut. Okay, we'll do that other side. Go back and forth on each part. Install the same part on each side. Grab your impact wrench. Tight both sides from the same position. Okay. Parts laid out in the order they are installed, including the attaching hardware. Knowing the order of installation, Jason picks out the parts he needs and heads to the car. The lift is an invaluable tool to raise the car to a comfortable working position to turn wrenches. Not too high, not too low. Okay, here's the lower control arm. It sits in the channel. It allows it to actually pivot the arm back and forth as a slot right here that the bolt goes through. The bolt goes in through the back side because there's a brace that goes across here. If these come loose, they'll come out and hit the brace and the bolt will not completely come out. Kind of a little safety deal. When the bolt pivots, it turns in this channel and allows the uh, control arm to go one way or the other. And that's how you can align the camber caster. Initial install, you just center it and then eyeball it later when you've got the car all together. And then you have to take it to an alignment shop, get it aligned. Okay. 
put a little grease on the boot so that the spindle won't rip the boot. It has some lubrication. Once that's tight, it allows this grease allows it to keep it from binding the rubber. I have seen them rip the boots, but by not doing that. all the cotter pins. Okay, that side is done. The uh, cotter pins keep the nut from ever coming loose. It's just a safety precaution. I check the joints to make sure they're smooth. Top shaft is smooth. And next we're gonna put the strut rods in and that stabilizes the lower control arm. We're gonna be installing those. These have new bushings. These actually you can get polyurethane bushing. In some cases using poly on this is kind of a no-no because they can actually be too stiff and snap the, the rod. These are the factory rubber ones. That strut rod goes in that little channel. Yeah, the channel that holds your bushing and the top of the strut rod. And the nut up here is a lock nut when in 68 they changed that to a uh, pinned nut. Also the strut rod has this little nook cup right here. This is the steering stop. So right here this machined area hits that and stops the steering from going too far. Hmm. Yeah, the uh, bushing actually fits into a bigger hole and gives it more stability. These are a fine thread. You want to make sure you don't get it cross-threaded. should go on easy, easy. They actually have the bolts in a cross pattern on the low control arm, so the control arm will work on either side. There's not a left and a right. Same way with the upper control arms. Both have a spline on them that you have to pull all the way down. It's easier if you get it lined up with the original splines. This is the cross member brace. You put this on after you get the lower control arms because the lower control arm bolts go through the back. Then this brace goes in. And if that, say this nut somehow come loose, the control arm bolt will not come out because it hits this brace. So this brace goes in after the control arms. And they have an odd bolt. They have a chamfer on it. Kind of like a lug nut or something. As you can see here, that washer will hit the brace and keep that bolt from coming out. It's a little safety deal. This uh, brace is also removable if you ever need to take the oil pan off the engine. Is that installed now? It's installed. 
there was absolutely no paint on top of the, the brace. Like there was no paint on it anywhere. No traces of paint had ever been on it. So I went back with a bare metal paint. Right now I'm gonna tighten the truck rods on the front. But it's a lot easier. Push this thing up, get to the nut without the spring in it. Well, easier might be one person on the spindle and a second person on the impact wrench. Jason White is a one-man shop, so tightening those strut rods becomes a test of strength and endurance. Let's see how long it takes. We're timing this and we're coming up on, what is it? 23 seconds. That takes a while. You wait until it comes up against the stop. Yeah, that way you can actually get the socket on the nut. Uh, apparently, that can be one of the problems. Forty seconds for this side. So that tighten tighten the strut rod where it should be, right? Yeah. Okay. Coil springs next. Okay, what are we doing now? I'm going to compress the spring to install it in the car. First, I'm going to install this spring insulator pad. This insulates the spring squeaks and rattles and gives it cushion so it's not metal against metal. These are nice. A lot of them just sit right on top. These actually rotate around like factory. And these are a hard plastic, kind of rubbery plastic. When the original ones were just straight rubber and they would deteriorate. This is a spring compressor. You have to maneuver this thing where you can get this piece out once the spring is in. The uh, look right here, the end of the spring goes towards the back like that. Now the spring perch will sit as low as you can possibly get it. That way you get the maximum compression out of it. This you want has to be removed somewhere in that shock tower so you don't want to you don't want to put it like that when you can't get it out you want to put it on this end where you can actually get this thing out later on setting it up is the pain sometimes you got to do it two and three times to get the right amount of compression get everything situated in the right spot so you're going to press compress it right there in the floor yep you really don't get quite the compression you want, so you kind of got to use a pry bar and move it around. But it's it's kind of a trial and error. If you get it compressed where you think it's close, see how it's going to fit in there, and you may have to compress it a little more. The count is 62 ratchets. And I put it on a towel so it doesn't scratch up the, the finish and it's easier on your knees. The count is now 157. You cannot use air tools on this. You cannot zip that in with an impact. It'll strip the threads out on the compressor. You have to do it by hand. Now you can zip it out with a tool, but not compress it. Slowing down as each compression takes more power. The count is 195. It could, and there's a possibility it could come loose. They usually don't go anywhere. I've had them come loose. I've dropped them. They usually just bounce. You, got, you want to respect it. Let's put it that way. The final count, 212. Lower it. I always lower it because I don't like that thing in my face. The uh, thing about a full restoration, everything is clean and new. Not a greasy old car you're working on. This is fun. Like you're the factory building a Shelby.
That makes it really nice, that being the move, because I can do it first time. It just falls in there. That's right? Yeah. That's, uh, normally you can't do that with the, uh, the spring perch, because it has a regular bushing. That thing will only go about right there. So I'll take a pry bar and I actually pry that so it'll go back as far as, so you get a straighter, flatter plane. But with this seat perch here, you can rotate that like that. You can easily place that spring. That, that right there is worth every penny of what that costs. Because of just safety, because you can do that right there. Nice. Great. That makes it so much safer and ease of install. The normal one is, I mean, you gotta push this down and you gotta take a pry bar. I usually put a pry bar on my knee and I'll push that to get into place. That's what makes it dangerous. Now we'll just loosen it off. Nerve wracking when you get to the end because then this thing wants to spin. So you gotta hold it real stiff until you get that thing to start seating. Jason needs an extension to reach deep into that shock tower. Once it touches, it's not so bad. The drawback to these rubber, these rubber gels don't want to stay in place. Nice, huh? There's one yeah. orange stripes on the back side now. You can barely see it. A lot of restorers will put it up here on the front where you can see them. But that's what you would call over restoration. These things were put all over the place. You don't know if they're going to be on the back side or on the front side. So it being back there on the back is more accurate. And you can't put that shock in there until you get the engine weight, get the wheels on. Then it pushes, pushes your suspension up in the place and you can actually bolt it in. Start on some of the steering components, the uh, gearbox, idler arm, drag link, and the power steering cylinder. Okay, first we put the gearbox on. These are the bolts for the gearbox and they have a um, slot in the washer. So when they're close to the frame, they'll clear the frame. It's like you uh, copied the uh, color marks that identified it. Yeah, all the inspection marks that are inspection of it assembled properly, filled with grease. With the pitman arm, also called the steering arm, already attached. Next, Jason tightens the steering box to the unit body. That's mounted? Yeah, that's mounted. That wasn't hard. Jason is already rounding up the hardware to mount the idler arm. This point right here for the steering box, it idles the other side and matches that, but it is just a pivot point. This idler arm mounts to the other side of the unibody. This is a very important component. These wear out. You get slop in your steering, probably need a new idler arm. This one is new. Brings the drag link back and forth. We'll tighten up the idler arm and then we'll install the drag link. Okay. The hardware is new to mount the drag link, but the drag link Jason restored. New ones are available. It costs less to rebuild this old one, and then we still had the Fomico stampings and the originality. It's like a fishing pole. <laughs> The threads are kind of boogered on it. On this, uh, this attaches to the uh, gearbox. This is the pitman arm bolt. Which threads are going we'll to have to put a tap on it. 20. It's a half inch 20, so that's it. 
that ball turns. So you gotta have the threads perfect on it. Can that fix it? Hopefully. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, it got bumped or something. Probably on disassembly. We're back. Close call. Something like that can shut you down. With the car on a lift, with brand new or restored parts, Jason White, an experienced restorer, assembles this 1967 GT500 without hesitation, moving from one job to the next. The time frame? Less than a day to do what you see in this video. Kind of like a one-man assembly line where parts are organized and ready to install and so no wasted effort, no time lost. In fact, Jason prefers to work on two cars to integrate the workflow from one to the other. Another cotter pin, huh? Okay. Now this is the bracket, close to the frame. Slave cylinder. Mm -hmm. Gonna act as a power. They got all these hoses. It's a dust boot that keeps dirt and debris out of the cylinder, keeps it from eating up the seal. Steering links, high rod ends, inner and outer. These, one has left hand threads, one has right hand threads. That way when you spin this, it tightens it. That's how you uh, line the front end on the toe in and out. This is the tie rod ends for the steering. It has right hand threads. This would be the left hand threads. And then when it's assembled, you can turn this and it'll pull the joints together for aligning the front end. Okay. Side. Now this can be turned. And that's how you line the front end. You just gotta eyeball it. This same one for the other side, huh? Yeah. Okay, that's the steering. Brake hubs on and the uh, brake caliper brackets. And we'll have a hub on there. We bought the tire to it. Yeah, these are the caliper brackets. He blasted them, painted them with a cast coat iron, and then went back with a uh, gasket cleaner. You could take it to a machine shop and have a machine it, but 90% of the machine shops will not do that. Okay, I'm gonna pack the bearings and install the new grease seals for the front hubs. And these are the original front hubs and discs. We have that Kelsey Hayes. So on the back, it seals, pulls the grease in. And then our original bearings. All these are a uh, Bauer bearing. As long as there's no pitting on the actual bearing, then they're fine. You can't even see really any wear. So pack them. This is the old way of doing it. So you start seeing the grease come through. You can see it right there. This is the old nasty way of doing it. They make tools now. This is a disc brake grease. You pack them on one side, then flip it over and pack the other side. This is what you call packing your wheel bearings, right? Yep. And then that taps in. This is the grease seal. It holds your grease in place. What do you call these? These are a seal installer. Bearing race and seal installer. You want to lubricate the seal itself. You don't want that dry. Wear it out. Yeah, they got a little surface rust on, a little overspray, but once you actually put the brake pads on them, and you clamp down about three or four times, it'll be shiny steel again. These don't have any major grooves or nothing, so they don't need to be turned. We're gonna be installing the brake shields. Short and long bolts. One long bolt here. Are those the covers off the original car? Yep, I blasted and painted. They got a little bit of pitting in them, but they have the Omoco on them. 
most of it's having all the right fasteners, all that on hand makes it a lot easier. Having the right parts. Alrighty, that's our caliper and dust shield. And here is the disc brake rotor. Proper range of this is to torque it to 90 foot pounds and then half a turn back. Put the rear brake lines on the rear axle. First, I'm going to install the brake hose, and it's installed using the vent into the axle tube. And then this mounts up to the bracket on the floor pan. This is the vent for the axle. It actually has a lining and attaches to it that runs up to this hole here to keep the dirt and water out of the axle. So we got a clip that holds the hose. It's kind of D-shaped. D fits in there. Uh -huh. And then that clip. Holds it in place. And then our brake line will fit into that and then there'll be a proportioning valve between this, but there'll be a little 90 degree fastens to this one. Next we'll put the uh, wheel cylinders on for the brakes. Yeah, this is a wheel cylinder which makes your brakes functional. And they attach right in here. And this is the bleeder screw. Same procedure for the passenger side. And then the brake lines for the rear axle. You can put the lines first, or you can put them however you, whatever you want to do. And these hook in these little holders. And you always got to tweak these a little bit. Yeah, it's close. I mean, it's yeah. you just got to kind of tweak it around a little bit. This one up This one lined up better. Okay. There it goes. There we go. Clips. Now, you're going to put your proportioning valve in? I don't have a proportioning valve yet. Oh, okay. But it'll go right here. Yeah. That'll be good. These are the uh, emergency brake cables, and they go to a holder right here, a little bracket. Turn that bracket. And then they run up to the front once you put the cable in and the dash, which I haven't installed yet. These go in there like that, and then they have a um, this hairpin clip. Make sure you hit yourself in the head. Until it pops out, sometimes you gotta do it a couple times. There, got it. All right. There it goes. That's all the suspension. Minus shocks right now, but it is a roller again. I could see that resolute look on Jason's face. The restoration had come to a milestone. And look how late in the day. January 30th, 18 degrees outside. Still hunting stock rims for the Shelby, so none to install yet. But the car was a roller. And next up would be application of that candy apple red paint to the exterior. Uh, refinish the backing plates. They have the uh, Kelsey Hayes on them. A lot of times these are semi-gloss black. But taking these apart, there's absolutely no paint behind the gaskets, no paint. Couldn't find any traces of paint on these anywhere. So they were obviously bare metal originally. So I refinished them in a paint that looks like bare metal. These are the original springs and I rebuilt them, refinished them, new clamps, and they were blasted. They got new front bushings there and new shackles as well. 
and then it's got new anti-squeaks in between the springs. These I had to do research. They're kind of a brownish color for this particular part number of spring. I found remnants on the front springs of the single orange. These are the original Kelsey Hayes discs that have been blasted and painted. Right here's the original uh, bearings. I always reuse original bearings if they're in good shape because you these are a Bauer bearing, made in the USA. They are like brand new still. This is the uh, valve body for the power steering. What this does is this pivot, it goes into the pitman arm. It actually moves ever so slightly back and forth. So it reads which way you're turning and it pushes a valve inside this and that will channel fluid from these right here to the power stream valve. It'll channel the fluid and it'll pull or push this slave cylinder. Mm -hmm. And that acts as a power spring snubbers, kind of like a traction bar. As the spring comes up, as if it's hopping, this snubs it and helps on traction and helps on the spring wrap up. This is original Shelby piece. It's got the original S7 MS5 part number. I blasted them, blasted the rust off of them and, and finished the, um, in a cast coat because they are a cast um, iron piece. So I use a cast coat paint on them. It looks like bare metal. And when they manufactured these from Ford, they would put the joint in and then they dipped these in black paint, but they didn't want to get paint in the joint, so they only dipped it halfway. And that's why they're two-toned. 